From Hollywood, it's time now for John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. My name's Elgin, Mr. Dollar. Claims Division, Delaware Mutual Light. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Elgin? Would you be free to work on a case for us? Oh, I might be. What kind of a case is it? It involves a man named Patterson and a claim we paid off to the tune of $40,000. Uh-huh. You see, Patterson died in 1947. All the routine procedures were followed. And there was no reason for not honoring the policy at the time. And there's reason now, Mr. Elgin? That's for you to find out, Mr. Dollar. A lifelong friend of the deceased swears he's still alive and kicking. Oh. I'll take the case, Mr. Elgin. <laughs> John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, Hartford, Connecticut. To Controller's Office, Delaware Mutual Life Insurance Company, Wilmington, Delaware. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Walter Patterson matter. Expense account item one, $78.14, fare and incidentals between Hartford and Wilmington. I arrived at 2.30 in the afternoon, found a room at the Chesapeake Hotel, stowed my luggage, and went directly to your headquarters, Mr. Elgin. Of course, reports like this cross my desk ever so often. If I ran them all down, I'd get nothing else done. And ten times out of ten, the report's wrong. Yes, I know that, but this report bears investigation. I can remember three years after my father's death, I saw a man on a subway train in New York who... Well, he looked exactly as I remembered my dad. I finally walked up and asked him his name. The minute he spoke, I lost the impression altogether. I think a lot of people have had that same kind of experience at one time or another, don't you? Yes, I suppose so. We all have a double somewhere, they say. An old friend saw this man, Patterson? Yes, in Tucson, Arizona. Her name's Virginia Collier. I'd have her here now to talk to you, but unfortunately, she's en route to Europe. Oh, I see. Two weeks ago, Mrs. Collier stopped off in Tucson on her way back from Los Angeles. She claims that she saw Walter Patterson as big as life sitting in a bar at the El Conquistador Hotel. Is that all? No, she managed to talk to him. He told her his name was Euler, William Euler. Mrs. Collier says he pretended not to know her at all. Uh-huh. Now, here's the first point, Dollar. I wired authorities in Tucson to run a check on William Euler. In their conversation, Euler told Mrs. Collier that he'd been born and raised in Tucson. But from all we could gather, he'd never bought property or made a financial negotiation there until June of 1947. Oh, wait. This uh, Mrs. Collier, do you consider her reliable? Well, that's another point. If it had been anybody else, I don't think I'd have bothered to make even a cursory check. But Mrs. Collier practiced law here for a number of years and sat on the circuit bench for two terms. She's most reliable, and she knew Walter Patterson all of his life. Okay. Go on. The next thing is that Mrs. Collier distinctly remembered Patterson's limp. He was a pilot in the war. One leg was about half an inch shorter than the other from injuries he received in the crash. Mrs. Collier said this man, Yoler, had an identical limp. Well, with a similarity of features, it would be easy for her to imagine that part, don't you think? Ah, uh, yes, yes, I know what you're driving at, but there are some other things, too. Mrs. Collier asked Yoler if he'd ever gone to Amherst. That's where Patterson went to college. Yoler denied it, said he was a Notre Dame graduate. That didn't check out either. Now, we can assume that William Yoler merely looked a great deal like the late Walter Patterson and told some inaccuracies in a conversation at the bar. Or we can assume that he's really Walter Patterson, covering rather badly in the face of an old acquaintance who recognized him. At any rate, this is Mrs. Collier's entire statement duly notarized. All right. Now, this is a copy of the original policy on Patterson. How long with this company? Since 1936. Started with two $5,000 policies and built up to a master over a period of years. I see. Here. $20,000. Patterson was killed in a plane crash, and we paid double indemnity on the accident clause. Oh. It happened in April of 1947. Patterson took off on a rented plane one day and crashed offshore down the coast. Part of the plane wreckage was recovered, but his body was never found. The appellate court declared him legally dead after the usual three-year waiting period, April 5, 1950. Patterson's lawyer uh, filed claim for the widow April 17th, and we issued a full check April 30th of that year. 
Investigator's reports? Uh, right in this folder. Now, this is the last picture ever taken of Patterson, and these are his vital statistics. Uh-huh. I didn't know exactly what you'd want to do first, so uh, I thought they might prove helpful. If we had a body to exhume, it could all be handled rather simply. Is Patterson's widow the beneficiary? Yes. Gloria Ann Patterson. Uh, incidentally, uh, she knows nothing about this report yet. Oh? Well, where'd these things come from? Pictures and fingerprints aren't stock material in insurance files. Uh, Mr. Brennan, Patterson's lawyer, gathered them for me. He's been very helpful. Oh. Has Patterson's widow been checked? As far as the money goes, she simply banked it in the savings account. Hasn't been touched at all. Well, on the face of it, that would eliminate the probability of any fraud on her part. Yes, the moment. it would. Well, I want to look this all over. Sure. Uh, you'll keep in touch with me, won't you? You bet. I spent the remainder of my day in and about Wilmington talking to the principals connected with the plane crash death of Walter Patterson. Number one was the radio operator who'd spoken to him last. Number two, a mechanic at the flying field. And number three, Lieutenant James Craigson, Coast Guard, who had conducted the search in the bay. See attached statement. We both agreed that an unreported rescue was possible but highly improbable. And when I left for Tucson that night, I was more or less convinced that all I'd find there would be a lot of desert sunshine. Expense account item two, $202.25 plane fare and incidental expenses from Wilmington to Tucson. I settled for a motel room out by the Veterans Hospital, slept six hours, then looked up Sergeant Tyler at the police station. Yeah, sure, Mr. Tyler. What can I do for you? Well, Mr. Elgin said you sent him a little information on William Yoler. I wonder if you have anything to add to that, Sergeant. No, nothing much. Of course, I don't know what you folks are driving at exactly. I just checked up on him a little bit. Well, he resembles a man who's supposed to be dead. And that's why I'm here. I see. Well, there's nothing much I can add to what I sent Mr. Elgin, Dollar. You always never been in any trouble around here. Gets along fine. You were the one who checked out the residency business? Yeah. According to Vitals, you wasn't born in this state, and I, like I said, no one knew him around here until five years ago. What does he do? Nothing. Always seems to have plenty of money. Bought a nice little house out in Sierra Vista. Paid $42,000 for it. Is he married? No, lives alone there. Putters around with clay and painting. You know if he flies? I couldn't tell you that. He might. How about his friends? Lots of them, Mr. Dollar. A little town like this, you get to know people fast. Now, really, you folks might be spending a lot of money for nothing. Will Yola don't seem like the kind of fellow who's hiding out from anybody. Yeah, I agree. But I'll have to talk to him anyhow. Yeah. Here's his address. Sure pretty day, isn't it? Mm, sure is. Mr. Yoler? Yo. Who are you? My name is Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh? Well, come on in. Oh, thanks. Take a chair. Anywhere. Now, what's, what's on your mind? Oh, I'm just making a routine check, Mr. Yoler. I thought perhaps you could help me. No, what about? Well, I'm running down a report in the home office. Now, tell me, you happen to remember a few days ago when you were out at the El Conquistador Hotel? I'm out there all the time. What about it? I steal something? No, uh, you met a woman named Carlier. Did I? Yes, it was at the bar. You had a drink with her. No, I might have. Uh, I still don't understand. Though. Well, I know it seems confusing. Uh, maybe this will help. Take a look at this. Mm -hmm. Well, you'll admit you look a great deal like the man in the picture. Yeah, I suppose I do. Be darned, I, I, I'd do it that. Well, that's why I'm here. You see, the company I represent insured the man in this picture for quite an amount of money. He was lost in a plane crash five years ago. The Mrs. Collier, who saw you here, thought you were him. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not. I, I wasn't in the Army. You want to smoke? Oh, thanks. Yeah. She was a lifelong friend of the man, Mr. Yoler. I have her sworn statement about the identity. 
Well? What years did you go to Notre Dame? I didn't go to Notre Dame. What is this? Well, that's what you told Mrs. Collier. Oh. Uh, oh, now I remember that woman. Well, that was um, on Sunday. Yeah, well, I, I might have told her anything, Mr. Dollar. You know, she was one of those inquisitive kind. I never could make out what was on her mind. Oh, now I get it. You, uh, she thought that I was this man. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, did you go to college? Yeah, Tulane. I got out in 36. You haven't lived in Arizona all your life. Where else have you lived? Uh, Mr. Dollar, I, I don't want to be unpleasant, but do you have any right to uh, ask me questions like this? Well, no, I don't. But you'll help me a lot if you'll answer them, Mr. Yoder. All right, why not? Well, I've lived in Cincinnati, Buffalo, around the country. I came here a few years ago for my health. I got a little asthma that bothers me. Ever been married? Yeah, once, 1944. Didn't last very long. Anything else you want to know? Well, are you in a hurry? I can come back no, later. No, no, not exactly. I, I've got to go downtown today, that's all. Look, uh, you seem like a nice enough guy, but it makes me uncomfortable answering these questions of yours. Well, and I appreciate the time you've given me already, Mr. Yoler. Please understand, it's just a matter of identity. Well, you know who I am. I just told you. Mm, that's true. Uh, I don't like this business much. Is there any way that we can eliminate it? Uh, I have a birth certificate and some other papers. You can have them. Make photostats if you well, like. Well, that's very kind of you, Mr. Yoder. Well, they're in my safety deposit box down at the bank. I'll get them for you this afternoon. Okay. Uh, my job is to check them. Sure. Sure, it's okay by me. Well, how do you like Tucson? Well, it's a lot different from Connecticut. Yeah, I'll bet. The uh, birth certificate and whatever else you have will help a lot, but I wonder if I could ask another favor. Sure, what is it? The most positive identification would be fingerprints. Oh? See, all are, I'm not so much interested in who you are, but simply in proving that you're not Walter Patterson. If you volunteered a set of prints, it would save me a great deal of digging around. Could you drop in at the police station? <laughs> Certainly, Mr. Dollar, why not? Well, that'll be fine. That's all right. Nice meeting you. Same here. If he was trying to cover something, it certainly wasn't apparent from his conversation or his actions. He was almost too anxious to help me. By five o'clock, I had made reservations to return to Wilmington because the set of fingerprints she attached, which Mr. Yoler made at the Tucson police station later that day in no way matched the right thumb and index prints recorded in your file for Walter Patterson. In short, the report seemed erroneous. William Yoler might not have been William Yoler, but he certainly was not Walter Patterson. Johnny Dollar. Will Yoler, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yeah. Thanks for the prints. Dollar, I I've got to talk to you. Something wrong? Plenty. Do you know how to get to the Arizona Inn? Well, I can find it. All right, I'll be there in 20 minutes. <laughs> the tone of his voice, I felt compelled to get there in half that time. I sat down at the bar and ordered a drink and waited for him to show up. An hour later, I was still waiting. I called his house three times and received no answer. I began to get worried. Finally, I left word with the bartender and took a cab out to his house. I arrived there at 8.35. There were no lights on and apparently no one around. I walked up to the front door and found it partially open. Yola? Yola? Mr. Yola? Operator? Give me the police, please. One moment. Tyler speaking. Johnny Dollar, Sergeant. Hi, how's it going? Thought you were leaving. Not for a while, Sergeant. I'm at Will Yoler's house. He's been murdered. We'll return to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Every Saturday on CBS Radio, Theater of Today brings you fresh, gripping drama, well-acted stories of human relations. Sometimes it's comedy, sometimes serious. 
Always, theater of today strikes a chord of response in listeners who readily identify the stories with their own experience, past or present. Remember to hear theater of today every Saturday in the daytime on most of these same CBS radio stations. Now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Turned out to be a long night. Sergeant Tyler and several homicide officers arrived at the murder scene within a matter of minutes and got right down to the matter at hand. The owner had been beaten to death. There were signs of a violent struggle having taken place all over the house, kitchen, bathroom, living room. As far as the police could determine, nothing was missing. The motive, the name of the killer, and any probable suspects were all up in the air. As Sergeant Tyler drove me back to my motel room. The whole thing's a mess, Dollar. You sure he didn't say anything else to you on the phone? Just asked to meet me. I'll admit he sounded frightened and worried about something. I don't get it. Our business was all finished. He wasn't the man I was looking for. You going to be around for a while? Well, if I can help you, I'll stick around, sure. Otherwise, I'll get back to Wilmington as soon as I can. I'd like to have you around for a day or two. You have a particular reason, Sergeant? Yes, I do. What? I want to find me a killer, and I think you can help. Nobody walks into a man's house, fights with him, breaks up furniture and lamps, beats him to death without making a lot of noise about it. Well, the wind was pretty strong. I don't care if a hurricane was blowing. When people fight like that, there's always noise. Somebody heard something. Somebody saw something. Somebody saw someone. My men will cover every house in Sierra Vista if they have to, to turn up a witness. Bound to be somebody, somewhere. Dogged Sergeant Tyler turned out to be 100% correct. In fact, 300% correct. For by 11 o'clock the following morning, his men had located three different people who had information about the brutal murder of William Mueller. One of them, a Mrs. Lucas, gave us what turned out to be our best lead. I take a walk every evening after dinner. The nicest part of the day. And you were out walking last night, Mrs. Lucas? Yes. I told the officers everything. Would you tell us, please, Mrs. Lucas? I walked past Mr. Yoler's house on my way down the Arroyo. What time was that, Mrs. Lucas? Between 7.30 and 8. And I saw Mr. Yoler standing in front of the house talking to this man. I spoke to him, and he spoke to me. Can you describe the man he was talking to? Yes, I saw him very well. He was a very large man. Bigger than Mr. Yoler, and Mr. Yoler always struck me as a big man. Uh, go on. Well, this man was a good two inches taller. He had on a top coat, a tweed one, and he had his hat in his hand. His hair was red. How old would you say? Not over 40. Have you ever seen him before? No. I noticed him when I walked by on my way down the Arroyo, as I said. And then when I was coming back, I could see through the window, and he was still there. With the lights on in the house? Oh, yes. In the living room. And the porch light was still on, too. Would you know this man if you saw him again, Mrs. Lucas? Well, yes, I would. I'm sure I would. He was so big. Was there a car out in front of Mr. Yola's house? I didn't notice one. There could have been. Was there a bus service that runs oh, up there? Oh, no. Everyone who lives in the Arroyo has to have a car. No buses up there at all. Sergeant Tyler issued an all-points bulletin according to the description given by the witnesses. In the meantime, his men checked the local cab companies and found out that one of the drivers had carried a fare to William Yoler's house at 6.30 the previous evening. The cab driver verified Mrs. Lucas's description of the suspect and the important information that he had picked up the suspect at the airport. When that was checked, it was found the man had arrived on a plane from the east at 5.45 in the afternoon. He had used the name Roger Bales. But except for a strong case against him... The whole thing was still very confusing from our point of view. Expense account item three, $6.50. Long-distance telephone charges to your office. Well, I'll be darned. You have to stay there? Well, they've asked me to, Mr. Elgin. Well, as far as the insurance company's concerned, it's really none of our business, is it? That's right, Mr. Elgin. If I'm going to... Dollar. Oh, hold on. Yeah? 
Answer from Washington on your wire. Oh, yeah? Here. Let me see. Mr. Elgin. Yes? It is our business, after all. Huh? The War Department has a better sample of Walter Patterson's prints than you gave me. Please check out. Uh, slow down. I still don't understand. I wired a sample of Yoler's prints to the War Department this morning for a positive identification. They just answered me. Yoler was Walter Patterson. Uh-oh. Where did you get those prints that were in the file you gave me? Uh, Mr. Brennan, Patterson's lawyer, got them for me. From a pilot's license. Uh-huh. I'd better call Mr. Brennan. Oh, don't you dare. Well, what can I do to help you, Dollar? Don't open your mouth. I'll handle it when I get there. Expense account item four, $42.85. Expenses while in Tucson. And item five, same as item two, traveling expenses from Tucson to Wilmington. I arrived at 10.15 in the evening, called you, obtained lawyer Brennan's home address, and went directly there. The house was English, conservative, expensive. And the fire in the living room looked cheerful when the door opened. Yes? Good evening. I'd like to see Mr. Brennan, please. It's rather important. Uh, my name is Dollar. Bob's been ill for the last two or three days, Mr. Dollar. He's up in his room reading now. If you're sure it's important, I'll disturb it you. It is, Mrs. Brennan, very important. I'm not Mrs. Brennan. I'm Mrs. Patterson. What? Is there something wrong? Oh, no, no, Mrs. Patterson. Come nothing in, at all. Mr. Dollar. If you'll excuse me, please. I'll see if he can see you. I watched Walter Patterson's widow disappear up a column stairway. I hadn't been ready to meet this attractive, well-groomed woman. But after I had met her and seen her for that brief moment, I was partially prepared to meet Robert Brennan, attorney at law. Mr. Dollar, Bob. Oh, uh, hello, Mr. Dollar. You're a late caller. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Bob, I'll run along. It's almost seven. All right, dear. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night, Mrs. Patterson. Brennan, I just flew in from Tucson, Arizona. I'm an insurance investigator. Oh. Well, good night. Uh, Gloria, you'll be interested in what Mr. Dollar has to say. What? I don't understand, Bob. Let's go into the living room. Come on, dear. Are you sure you want Mrs. Patterson here? Yeah, Gloria, I didn't get these bruises falling down a flight of stairs. I got them in a fight. What? I flew to Tucson the day before yesterday to see Walter. What? Yes, Walter's been alive all this time. Bob. This is only for her benefit, Dollar. I'll tell it just once. When you get me in court, it'll be different. How did it happen, Brennan? Gloria, Walt didn't die in that crash. He was picked up in the bay by a fishing boat on its way to Florida. The first port they came into was Charleston. He phoned me long distance from there and told me all about it. This was ten days after we all thought he was dead. Glory, it was his idea. You've got to believe that. What was his idea? He hated you. You know how often he asked you for a divorce? It was the idea he had when he phoned me from Charleston. He said it was his chance to get away from you. He knew how I always felt about you, and he said I could have you for a price. You've been supporting him wherever he's been since then? 25000 a year, regular monthly payments. I could afford it. I could afford anything for you, Gloria. Did he tell you he hated me? Did he? He just wanted to be away from you, from everything. The war changed him that way. Uh, about the day before yesterday... The man at the insurance company called up making inquiries. I didn't know if he'd sent an investigator out there or not, but I gave him a lot of information and material that, well, it should have helped throw you off. It threw me off, all right, especially the fingerprints. Mr. Dollar can tell you, Gloria, how Walt didn't want to be here with you. Isn't that right, Dollar? Didn't he do everything he could to make you think his name was Yoler? Uh-huh. You see, Gloria? Where is he now? He's dead, Mrs. Patterson. Truly dead now. Oh. That's all I have to say, Dollar. You fought with Walter. You killed him. It was him or me, Gloria. 
I... He phoned me two days ago and said that the police had been checking on him. I told him what it was all about, not to get scared. But he was scared, and I got a plane the first chance I had. What did you argue about? Apparently, you'd been there that morning. He was going to tell you the truth and claim he had amnesia. He said he had a date to meet you. You didn't answer my question. What do you mean, I didn't answer? I just, I just told you. He was going to blow the whole thing. Oh, Bob. All I wanted out of this was you, Gloria. He didn't want you. I did. Last week, you said you decided to marry me. It took you five years to decide that. And it took him one lousy afternoon to decide he was going to come back to you. I realize that the confusion is set down in this report is worthless as evidence both to the police and your insurance company. The proof that Brennan killed Patterson will be a matter for the courts to decide. The proof that Gloria Ann Patterson is guilty or not guilty of a fraudulent claim is a matter for you to decide. At any rate, she is a widow now. And I personally am convinced that she had no complicity in the matter of claims, murder, or collusion. Expense account item six, same as item one. Expenses from Wilmington to Hartford. Expense account total, $610.13. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> 